Austin, Texas, how the hell are you? Great to be back. Oh, man, it's so great to be back in Austin, Texas, man. I just have so much fun when I'm here. I see so many friends. Thanks for coming out. I was in Bakersfield, California, Wednesday night. Boy, you people think you're stupid. <laughs> I, I, last time I was in Austin was the first time I've ever blatantly been offered a three-way. And, and I turned it down because it was one of those deals where it was two dudes and me. <laughs> I don't even watch Two and a Half Men. <laughs> We flew in from uh, Los Angeles and we were going through LAX and going through screening. And uh, this guy's just losing his fucking mind because I guess he doesn't travel that much. He's not used to this equipment. And he's just going crazy. And you, you know, you can have fun with that. You can do what I do. I take two Viagra and demand a pat down. <laughs> What's that in your past, Mr. White? I have no idea. <laughs> You're gonna need to pat that down. <laughs> pat it back up again. <laughs> Give it a couple twists, see if it's hooked to anything. <laughs> you might wanna go wash your hands. <laughs> I started this tour this summer in Las Vegas and while I was in Vegas, I broke this tooth off at the gum line in an alcohol swimming pool related incident. <laughs> I had a show to do in four hours. I was drunk and missing a tooth. <laughs> it looked a little unprofessional. <laughs> Not to me, but to the fine folks at the Mirage, you goddamn sure did. I told him, I said, you got to get a uh, dentist to patch this up. I will not go on stage looking like this because this tooth doesn't look that big until it's gone. <laughs> they found an all-night dental school. <laughs> this dentist is 14 years old. <laughs> he hooks me up to the gas and I don't feel anything. I'm like, dude, you need to turn this gas up. And he goes, there are regulations, the state of Nevada, state of which, code one, second four. <laughs> Fuck. And I asked him, I said, where'd you go to college? He goes, Brigham Young. I'm like, fuck, dude, turn it up to Catholic. <laughs> Never let a Mormon set your buzz level. <laughs> Never, don't do it. And I'll tell you why, they don't understand fucked up the way you and I do. <laughs> they don't, they're guessing and they're shitty guessers. When he got through with the procedure, you could still tell which tooth he worked on because it was a different color. <laughs> My teeth looked like Indian corn. <laughs> I had to go to my dentist who's pitching veneers for my teeth because he says I'm doing widescreen, high definition television, which is nobody's friend, man. Every actor I know in Hollywood would rather have low definition, narrow screen TV so they look thin and fuzzy instead of clearly fat. I would like to see my dick on a widescreen TV. <laughs> that way I can quit looking at it through my reading glasses. <laughs> Put these on, baby. <laughs> it looks bigger than it feels. I had no idea how expensive veneers were, man. They wanted to do eight teeth on the top and six teeth on the bottom, and I was like, well, how much does that cost? And he says, $27,500. Fuck, how much is dental school? <laughs> I'll teach my mother how to do it. <laughs> You're going back to college, Mom. I never went to college. Well, this be fun for you then. <laughs> it was a weird week. And I knew it was gonna be a weird week because it started off weird. I was gonna go to Vegas 
a day early to uh, do some media, and I wanted to see the show called Love. It's also at the Mirage, Beatles, Cirque du Soleil show. Fantastic fucking show. And uh, so I, I was talking to my, my wife, and I live in Atlanta and Hollywood, and, and uh, we were out in California. And I said, I'm leaving today at 3.30 to go to Las Vegas. And I have an airplane that you guys bought me. <laughs> I like it a lot. Half the Fortune 500 companies in America have let go of their private jets. Not Ron White, Inc. I'm flying that son of a bitch straight into bankruptcy. I guarantee you one day I'll be living in a double-wide trailer with shag carpet and I'll have a jet with weeds growing through it. I'll be in the front seat going, push me around some. And I don't come from money. I come from the opposite of money. I come from no money. <laughs> 10 years ago, I lived in a camper in my friend's backyard. He didn't even know I was there. <laughs> it wasn't even a nice camper. It was like a homemade pop-up camper. It looked like somebody had duct taped a tent to a golf cart. <laughs> I had a 20-inch Coleman television. I had to pump it up during commercials. <laughs> you couldn't watch porn on it because nobody's that coordinated. <laughs> I was broke. I owe the IRS a bunch of money because I don't understand how that works. It's confusing. When I started doing stand-up, they said that made me an independent contractor, and they said I needed to start filing my taxes quarterly, which I thought meant every 25 years. <laughs> my brain won't wrap itself around shit that complicated, man. My brain does this. That's it. That's all it does. I have attention deficit disorder. I have learning disabilities. I don't have a high school diploma. I'm smart, but you can't prove it on paper. <laughs> I do have a GED, and if you don't know what GED stands for, you probably got one too. <laughs> anyway, I told my wife, I said, I'm leaving today at 3.30 to go to Vegas. My wife's singer, songwriter, composer, Margot Ray is her name, and uh, a brilliantly talented woman. And, and uh, she says, well, I'm working with a guitar player in the studio till five o'clock. You can't wait till 5.30 so I can fly with you. And I said, can you be there at 5.30? And she said, yes, which I knew was a lie because she's the biggest liar in my life. <laughs> when it comes to how long it's gonna take her to get somewhere, I hear her on the phone all the time just lying through her teeth. It's, we're two exits away, traffic's really heavy, we should be there in 15 minutes. I'm like, you're in the fucking bathtub. <laughs> We wouldn't be there in 15 minutes if we were where you said we were. <laughs> but I told her, I said, you get there at 5.30, you can fly with me, but let me tell you something, sugar tits, at 5.31, I am wheels up and I am fucking gone. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> Not very loud. But I said it. <laughs> 5.31 gets there. Is she there? No. Do I leave? No. No. <laughs> 6.01 gets there. Is she there? No. Do I leave? No. Why? Because this dick won't suck itself. That's why. It won't. I've asked it to many, many times. In fact, the other day, I sat my dick down, I looked him straight in the eye, and I, I said, listen, I know I've drug you into some pretty muddy shit in the last 35 years. I need you to get past that, learn how to suck yourself so I can grow a spine and get on with my goddamn life. It went in one ear and out the other. My dick has ears. 
It has an eye and it has two ears and a double chin. <laughs> Mr. Potato Dick. The cutest thing you ever saw. I got little outfits I put on them. One of them's a raincoat. Not a condom, a raincoat, a little yellow slicker with that hat. And a, looks like that fish and chips dude. It's the exact same size as the one on the box. That's just an interesting fact. <laughs> what is it, Ron? <laughs> an interesting fact. So we go see Love and uh, Beatles Cirque du Soleil show. I'm a huge fan of the Beatles, and I just love their music, always have. And Cirque's always fun, and uh, their, our shows are at the same time, so I, I'd never been able to see it. And I got eight people from my camp. My wife's sitting next to me. We have great seats because I work for the Mirage, and everything's perfect except right behind me, these two chicks are just jabbering. Not about the show, just jabbering. Just jabber, jabber, can't shut up. Jabber, jabber, won't shut up. Jabber, fucking jabber, fucking jabber, jabber. The kind of chicks that could talk around a blowjob. You know what I'm saying? Well, I told them all day, if you don't fix that goddamn screen door, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna hurt some fucking people. If I come on one more time, that baby got a shitty diaper wrapped around his ass. I'm gonna goddamn blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna go to the swap meet, get a dress to wear at Arby's on Sunday. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I turned around and looked. I noticed her husband weren't with him. I figured they're at a gun show trying to find a way out of this fucking thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's way better. <laughs> I hear the guy sitting next to him go, hey, could you hold it down? My family's trying to watch the show. And she goes, fuck you, we paid our money, whatever the hell we want. And I'm just steaming fucking pissed. They're ruining my goddamn night. I can't hear anything but that. I've been waiting for a year to fucking see this show. And I turned around and very politely, <laughs> don't start with me. Very politely, I said, lady talking during live theater, as far as social skills goes, is like shitting in the street. <laughs> she goes, you better mind your own business. I said, you better quit shitting in the street. <laughs> she goes, I'll have you thrown out of here. I said, if you don't quit flapping your fucking cock holster. <laughs> Everybody heard that. Before it was a little disturbance right behind me, very few people privy to that one. Then 1,700 people hear me go, if you don't quit flapping your fucking cock all night. <laughs> this is all at a show called Love, by the way. <laughs> I had her murdered and buried in the desert. It's Vegas, baby. Careful who you fuck with. <laughs> and legend has it, if you go out into the desert and the moon is full and the wind dies down, you can still hear her jabbering. <laughs> I'm a street shitter, I'm shitting in the street. Did you, what the fuck was that? That's that chick Ron killed. <laughs> they call this Jabber Gulch. My favorite thing about playing Vegas is I get to play this golf course called Shadow Creek, which is one of the most exclusive golf courses in the world. I worked for them three years, didn't even know it existed because they knew if I found out it existed that I'd pester the fuck out of them until they put it in my contract, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> it's amazing, this golf course is just fucking so tricked out. The first time I walked through the gates, I was like, nobody's stopping me. <laughs> where all the pros play when they're in Vegas and I was out there this summer and Tiger Woods was out there just dicking around. <laughs> yeah. 
I may sign my golf glove. I got to me, this is the most famous person I've ever met, and I know a lot of famous people, but nobody as famous as Tiger fucking Woods. I love Tiger, man. I defended Tiger when all that stuff first came out. When I heard those initial rumors, I felt sick to my goddamn stomach for the guy because I've never been accused of doing anything I didn't do. <laughs> Not one goddamn time. I did it every single time. Not once could I go, no, that was Glenn Campbell. <laughs> hey, a lot of things smell like strippers. And I defended him to my wife. I said, you don't know what this guy's been through. He had his first famous golf shot on television when he was two years old. You don't know what his home life's like. You can't judge a guy because he made one mistake. And he gets caught with number 13, 14, 15, 16. I started going, God damn, Tiger, come on, buddy. And it got to the point where every time he got caught with another woman, my wife would go like this. What? I don't even know the fucking guy. You act like I was holding his dick the whole time. We watched him make that long apology on television and afterwards my wife goes, well, do you think a guy like Tiger could quit cheating on his wife? And I said, shit. <laughs> <sighs> you bet. Which you know is bullshit, because you know as well as I do, if a guy likes strange, getting him to quit wanting strange is like getting a dog that likes to kill chickens to quit killing chickens. <laughs> they don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> you gotta quit killing chickens. All right, let me see if I got this straight. <laughs> I can still kill chickens. No, you can't kill chickens anymore. All right. Let's say I'm in a hotel room with the chicken. Let's say the chicken just wants to touch me. Can I kill that chicken? No? My wife told me all women want the same thing. They want to marry somebody who will never have sex with anybody else, no matter what. And I said, well, then maybe you should consider marrying somebody that nobody else wants to fuck. <laughs> if it means that much to you, you know. Don't marry the most famous golfer in the world. Marry the most famous Frisbee golfer in the world. <laughs> Ain't no line to fuck that dude. We had a chat about cheating that day, man. <laughs> My wife told me, she goes, listen, Ron, let's get this straight. Sex is sex, period. I said, no, now, wait a minute. Oral sex is not the same as intercourse. She goes, it's the exact same thing. I said, it's not the same price. <laughs> I heard that on the radio. <laughs> it all comes down to opportunity, man. Some guys are put into a position where they have to say no to beautiful women, and that is hard to do. And some guys are never put in that position, and that's way fucking easier. <laughs> I see these big 350-pound guys all the time going, I have never cheated on my wife. I'm like, I bet that was tough. <laughs> Tiger doesn't get any credit for all that pussy you turned down, and that's the number you're looking for right there. <laughs> my wife's best friend, her husband cheated on her, and my wife hates Tiger's guts, and I'm like, well, what about that guy? You don't hate that guy? She goes, he did it one time. I said, he had one chance. <laughs> this guy had sex with 100% of the women he possibly could his entire goddamn life. Tiger was 18 for 82,000. <laughs> that takes a little goddamn discipline right there. If 82,000 women want to have sex with you and you only fuck 18 of them, that's love. <laughs> he was in love with that woman. She broke his tiny tiger heart. <laughs> he 
You lost all those sponsors, which never made sense to me because his core fan base is men. I don't know, one guy in America gave a fiddler's fuck what he did. I guarantee you, not one guy in America went, really, Tiger got some straight pussy? I'm dropping at and <laughs> Not one guy gave me fiddler's fuck. <laughs> now, when they were around their wives, they'd act like they gave a fiddler's fuck, get all foghorn, leghorn. Why, I never, I can't believe a man would commit such transgressions towards his wife. I say, I say, how's his relationship with the Lord, I'd like to know. <laughs> then as soon as they're around, their buddies are like, wonder what kind of cologne he wears. <laughs> I want to smell just like that dude, man. <laughs> he lost so many sponsors, I'm thinking about bringing him over to Ron White, Inc. And not because we need a new face for the company. I'd just love to have somebody around the house to fade the heat when I fuck up. <laughs> Ron White, you are the most selfish prick I have ever met in my life. Tiger, get in here. <laughs> you tell her what you did. <laughs> Ron White, you are the finest man I have ever known. I shall fall to my bended knee and suckle your penis. <laughs> well, thank you, baby. Slow down. Watch out for those ears. <laughs> my New Year's resolution this year was to lose some weight and try to get in better shape. And I was working out yesterday, and I hurt my fat. <laughs> I sprained my fat roll. <laughs> Everybody in my camp's on my ass about taking better care of myself. I'm like, what? <laughs> my wife bought me a bicycle thinking I might ride it. It's for sale. <laughs> it's a good deal, too. It's like new. It's got 750 yards on it. <laughs> My wife wants me to start doing yoga with her, and I said, like, baby, I'm not that flexible. And she goes, you can bend over and touch your toes, can't you? I said, the only way I can touch my toes, somebody cuts them off and hands them to me. <laughs> I can't even stand on one foot unless somebody's shining a flashlight in my eye. <laughs> I thought this was funny. We were at my wife's yoga school the other day, and they have a vegan restaurant there, and my wife goes, why don't we eat here? We've never eaten here. And I said, fine, let's eat here, because this dick won't suck itself. <laughs> It's all about compromise, folks. <laughs> and I take my tray around to all the bean sprout piles and I get to the cash register and my tray is empty. <laughs> and the purple dreadlocked here kid that runs the cash register goes, Mr. White, aren't you gonna have something for lunch? And I said, there's, there's just nothing here that I eat. And he picks up a piece of carrot cake wrapped in cellophane and he hands it to me. He goes, try this, it's vegetarian. <laughs> the carrot cake is vegetarian? <laughs> yeah. So you mean to tell me there's no ham in this? Because <laughs> my mother makes a meat lover's carrot cake. It's got sausage, pepperoni, hamburger meat. Not really heart healthy. She serves it with a limpator and a stent. They have Snuggies now for dogs, and I love dogs, but if I ever see a dog wearing a Snuggie, I'm gonna kill it. Because that's what I think the dog would want me to do. <laughs> I think if all dogs go to heaven, Michael Vick's gonna be a little nervous if he makes the cut. No <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be an awkward pause at the pearly gates. <laughs>
really, they're all here? Yeah, it seems like they're waiting on you too, man. I'm gonna slip off to hell. Tell Bin Laden I said, fuck you. We got Bin Laden, man. It uh, took 10 years, it wasn't exactly a calf rope. He was in that house for six years with five wives. I would have shot my fucking self. I'd have had my head out the window screaming at drones, going, I'm over here! <laughs> Women. We have a little French bulldog named Pearl, and uh, the other day my wife said, I finally figured it out. That dog is jealous of me. That dog loves you so much, she can't stand it if I'm in the same room with you. And I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. And she walked into the kitchen, and when she did, Pearl jumped on my stomach and said, I can have all your babies at the same time. <laughs> She's coming back, act like nothing's going on. Nothing is going on. I didn't know whether to buy more of that weed or never smoke it again. I went with A. I got busted with weed in Florida last year. Less than a gram of weed. And they took my happy ass to jail. I've been partying in Florida for years. I didn't even know they had laws. Look to me like everybody just run a muck down there. And I'll run a muck with you. I will run the fuck out of a muck with you. <laughs> they took me to jail, man. And I'll tell you what happened. I, I fired these two pilots for being dickheads. And they were such dickheads, they started following my plane around on a software called FlightAware. And if you know the tail number, you can follow any plane in the world anywhere it goes. And then right before I'd land in a town, they call the cops, tell them it's a drug plane, so the cops would come fuck with me. That's pretty fucking funny. <laughs> then they were on the news in Atlanta, where I live, both of these assholes live on the news, going, Ron White is out of control. He gets drunk on his plane. He smokes pot on his plane. He has sex on his plane. I'm like, this is my plane we're talking about, right? <laughs> Not like I did that shit on a Delta flight, for fuck's sake. No, my phone's off. <laughs> my wife got pissed at me when I got busted with that weed and she smokes pot. What the fuck is up with that? I come home, she goes, you smoke too much pot. I said, oh, let me get this straight. You smoke the correct amount of pot. You ever smoke so much pot, your wife starts to make sense? <laughs> Me either. <laughs> I have this reoccurring dream that my wife gets run over by a bus. Does that make me a bad person? I'm driving the bus. <laughs> She's had enough. <laughs> Early last year in Florida, at SeaWorld of Florida, an animal trainer was killed by a killer whale. Huh? Turns out there's a reason they didn't name them Ocean Ponies. <laughs> Some things are exactly as they seem, folks. Killer whales kill. Pilot whales wear dark sunglasses. I'm not sure how the sperm whale got his name. 
but I'm not getting in the pool. <laughs> that whale got his job back. They put that whale back in the show. Now, when I first saw it on the internet, I mean, this will be world news. It wasn't even news at all. They put the whale back. This, this whale killed three people. This is a serial killer whale. <laughs> and he got his job back? If that would have happened at SeaWorld of Texas, that whale would have gone straight to the fucking electric pool. <laughs> And that's just a regular pool with a toaster thrown in it. <laughs> People think they're expensive to make, but it's like 14 bucks. <laughs> you can reuse the extension cord. <laughs> People don't know that. We'll get another toaster. Yeah. They busted a sushi restaurant last year in, in uh, LA selling whale and they find them 200,000 bucks. And uh, oh, that is so fucking wrong, man, to take a 50,000 pound majestic animal and serve it up two tiny slices at a time. Are you fucking... Oh, that's good. Got any more? Shit, yeah, we do. <laughs> we have a shit road. <laughs> we make a big commitment. I don't know how I got caught. Maybe that 14 foot fin hanging out of the dumpster. <laughs> I should have crossed a red. <laughs> yeah. Probably should have crossed a red. I live in Atlanta half the year, and last summer in Atlanta, an idiot teenager was decapitated at a major amusement park in Atlanta on a very famous roller coaster. And uh, now what I thought happened was he was on the ride, stood up, and got his head cut off. That's not what happened. What happened was while he was on the ride, his hat flew off. And when he got off the ride, he climbed over two fences and went through two gates, telling him not to, to retrieve this hat, which it turns out he didn't really need after all. <laughs> Why, that story is dripping with irony, Mr. White. part of the show where I prove my job is better than yours. <laughs> Cheers, you guys are fantastic. Thank you so much for coming out on Saturday and listening. I was at home last week and my nephew called our house and I never answered the phone in my house, ever. And I think he was surprised that I did and I answered the phone and he goes, Uncle Ron, is that you? I said, yeah, it's me. He goes, Uncle Ron, did you know it's okay to be gay? This is why I don't answer the fucking phone at my house right there. <laughs> now it's my problem. <laughs> I'm like, well, you're right, it is okay to be gay. Do you know what gay means? He goes, that's where a man likes a man or a woman likes a woman, but they can't have babies. Pretty close. <laughs> You believe that six years old, this kid knows what gay means? I didn't find out what gay meant until I started hitchhiking. <laughs> I wrote a book, Seven Silly Secrets Truckers Just Don't Want You to Know. <laughs> My wife and I are big fans of the uh, reality TV show on HBO called Pornucopia Sex in the Valley. It's a reality show about the pornography industry in the San Fernando Valley, which is where most of it's made. And uh, we bought the first season because it's fucking hilarious. And this one episode was about guys that were straight porn stars, but they were doing gay porn because it pays five times the money. And they're interviewing this guy, and he goes, yeah, I was in a scene yesterday with five guys at the same time, and I'm not even gay. I was like, you're gayer than I am. <laughs> If you can even think of what to do with five dicks at the same time, you're way fucking gayer than I am. <laughs> I was 
was having dinner. This is a gay part of my show. I was having dinner the other night with this uh, CBS executive and uh, who I've known for years. Great fucking dude, man. And he's gay. And I've never said a word to him about being gay. I just knew that he was. And we're having dinner in Beverly Hills and talking about a potential show. And uh, this chick walks into the restaurant that's L.A. smoking fucking hot, man. Probably an actress or a model. And she was an ilf, which means I don't care if she has children. <laughs> I don't think the letters line up, but that's what it means. <laughs> and she sits at a table kind of near us by herself. And I had a couple of bottles of wine with the dinner and a couple of scotches before that, and I was pretty drunk. And I said, you mean to tell me that that does nothing for you? And he looked at her and he goes, not a thing. I said, you mean you would rather have sex with me than her? <laughs> not by much. What if I lost some weight? <laughs> I'm doing yoga. And I'm eating ham-free carrot cake. My dick has ears. <laughs> That's my favorite thing about LA is the people out there are just so goddamn pretty, man. I'll tell you how it happened. Back in the 20s, they started making movies out there. And, uh, and when they did, all these beautiful people from all over America flocked the fuck out there to be in the movies. And they couldn't all be in the movies. Some of them got regular jobs, but they met those people that were in the movies. They got together, they had these beautiful babies. And those babies grew up and met other babies from the same area, and they got together and had even more beautiful babies. And almost the exact opposite thing is happening right now in Kansas. Kansas is full of ugly quitters. Have you ever been there? <laughs> it's true. Those people that live on the uh, fucking West Coast, their forefathers got on the Oregon Trail and fought hardships you and I can't even dream of with starvation and weather and crossing the Rocky Mountains. Not those people in Kansas. Their forefathers got on the Oregon Trail. St. Louis, Missouri. They got to Kansas and said, fuck it, I'm staying here. <laughs> and I'm going to fuck that fat girl right over there. We had a baby. It looks like a potato. <laughs> and that potato grew up and met another potato from the same town. And Abracadabra Topeka. <laughs> My wife came over to the store the other day and she goes, I was in the produce department today and this guy told me I was beautiful. Well, baby, he's right. You, you are beautiful. He goes, yeah, but he said it. I'm like, well, I'm saying it now. You're beautiful. Yeah, but he said it. Really? You ever overdraw his checking account? <laughs> you ever drive his brand new Mercedes straight through the fuck garage door? That ever happened to that guy? It happened to me, and I think you're so hot, I fuck you anyway. And if you're one of these guys going around to grocery stores telling married women they're beautiful, hey, fuck you. <laughs> Kill your own chicken, you mother chicken killing. <laughs> My wife's best friend has an autistic child named Lewis. Lewis is 12 years old, and he's the sweetest child I have ever known. Known him since he was six, and uh, we were at their house Labor Day. And Lewis informed me that he was going to run the 40 yard dash for the Special Olympics at Gwinnett High School near where I live in Atlanta. And he asked me if I'd come hoot for him. And I said, Lewis, I'd love to come hoot for you. I just need to check my schedule. And he goes, We checked it, you're clear. <laughs> said, well, then I'm your man, Lewis. And I got to admit, I was dreading it, and then I ended up having fun. I thought it was going to be sad. That's why I was dreading it. It's a celebration is what it is. People are tailgating. They're not painting their faces and bellies blue, but they're cooking sausages, getting hammered, betting on these races. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. They are betting on these races. And it's not easy to handicap a race. You got 17 special needs kids in six lanes. You don't know what the fuck's going to happen when they... 
campfire that starting pistol, they could scatter, <laughs> stop, drop, and roll. We saw it all that day. They're not drug testing these kids. <laughs> and they announced a 40-yard dash, and I was making a little wager on my man Lewis, which I did for 100 bucks. And, and I was looking down at the track, I'm up in the stands, and I was trying to figure out which one's Lewis, which isn't easy, because they all wear the exact same thing. They wear Special Olympics t-shirts, Special Olympics shorts, which they got that day. But you can wear uh, whatever footwear you want. And Lewis, for whatever reason, had chosen yellow rubber boots. <laughs> which didn't make sense at first, and then it started raining. <laughs> Fuck, if this thing goes off-road, I got a natural mutter. <laughs> and Lewis won. The yellow blur. That's what I call him now, the yellow blur. His mother, he loves that nickname. His mother called me the other day and she goes, would you please call Lewis the yellow blur? Put him on the phone. You're the yellow blur. It's not like professional sports. You go to a Lakers game, you wave at Kobe Bryant until your arm falls off. He won't wave back to you. Lewis waved back to you in the middle of a fucking race. He doesn't give a shit. Lewis is fan friendly. <laughs> Lewis will stop and sign an autograph. The yellow blur. <laughs> I took my son Tater Tot to uh, Europe this summer. <laughs> My son uh, is 21 years old now. He's in college, he's getting his master's in entertainment business. Uh, he's a great kid, man. He's, uh, I'm so proud of him. He's smart, he's funny. He has my brain's high-end peaks without my low-end problems. <laughs> and that's some good goddamn news for daddy right there. We've been monitoring it. He's funny, I was doing a corporate gig in Orlando where he goes to college and I was backstage with him. And I don't get asked to do a ton of corporate gigs because what do you want your corporate image to be? <laughs> we were hoping for an overweight alcoholic that smokes and cusses. <laughs> Let's call Lewis, see if Ron's free. Anyway, I'm backstage in the green room with my son, and I wear wild socks. And because I do, people give me bizarre socks for whatever reason. And uh, I'm backstage with my son, and I'm putting on these weird socks. And, and Marshall goes, uh, Dad, uh, those socks are gay. I said, chicks dig these socks. He goes, chicks wear those socks. All right, he's my kid, you can stop those tests. <laughs> I love his mom, man, his, his mom's great. She's my second wife, and uh, I never argued with her ever. She didn't want to be married to somebody that was always going to be on the road. And the only argument I ever remember having with her was when he was a toddler about whether or not we should spank him, and her contention was that if you had an argument with an adult and you disagreed with him, you certainly wouldn't hit him. I said, I would if they peed my face. <laughs> I'm not kidding, be in my face. See what the fuck happened. <laughs> she busted him with internet porn when he was 15 and I felt so sorry for him. She called me just squawking. Bruh, 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 bruh. And I felt horrible for the kid because when I was 15, I was so horny, I could jack off to the Sears catalog. <laughs> and that's just big girl panties and lawnmowers. I can't imagine being 15 years old and having an unstoppable stream of pornography piped straight into your goddamn bedroom. When I was a kid, I had to earn porn, man. You had to wait till your friend's dad went out of town on business. You had to pull down a rickety spring-loaded attic ladder. You had to crawl up into a dusty spider-ridden fucking crawl space, forage through cardboard boxes till you find an eight millimeter reel. Then what? Learn how to work a fucking projector, that's what. And after all that, you got silent, bushy porn. 
And if there was a soundtrack, it was always so fucked up you couldn't understand it. He's gonna stick his finger in her ear? No, his penis in her rear. Watch the movie. We had one friend that was two years younger than us and he went, she put it in her mouth. I didn't know she was gonna put it in her mouth. She's gonna need to brush her teeth. Not yet, but she will, watch the film. Note to self, put it in her mouth. <laughs> so Lori told me, she goes, that's my ex-wife's name is, she goes, you're gonna need to talk to your son about sex, it's time. And I said, well, you're right, it is. And she goes, when are you gonna do it, Ron? I said, he's gonna be at the house this weekend, so I'll talk to him then. And uh, I said, okay, fine. I said, oh, Marsha, turn off television. I said, turn it off, I need to talk to you. All right. I said, I want to talk to you about sex. He goes, oh, Dad, come on. I said, nope, you're 15 years old. It's time we had this talk. And he goes, okay. I said, the clitoris is as sensitive as an eyeball. Is that it? That's all I got. Don't go rubbing on it if it's dry. Turn that TV back on, boy. What about safe sex, Dad? Yeah, it's never safe. Their husbands always come home. That's a fucking myth. He's so smart, man. I just can't believe how smart kids are today. He can answer any question that you can come up with in two seconds off his phone. He's a computer freak anyway, but you ask any question, doesn't matter world geography, world history, a note and a song written 300 years ago, click, 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 there it is. When I was a kid, I had to believe my mother. That's it, that's all I had. I like, Mommy, where do rainbows come from? Well, 3,000 years ago, an 800-year-old man named Noah was commissioned by the Lord to build a giant ship and all the animals, two by two. You try to run that crap by a kid today, they're like, click, click, bullshit. <laughs> click, click, porn. <laughs> People fucking on my phone. If my mother didn't know the answer to a question, I had to go to the library, which is a building where they used to store the knowledge. Now it's just a place where homeless people piss. But my mother used to drop me off at the library when I was a kid, and I was always so intimidated by it because it was so big, and you had to be quiet because the knowledge is sleeping. And you had to learn a decimal system made up by some fuck named Dewey. <laughs> then you had to peruse a hundred thousand square foot building with volumes of knowledge from floor to ceiling, ceiling to floor. You had to cross-reference Dewey's bullshit with the author's name and the card catalog. And you finally get to the place where the knowledge that you seek is supposed to be, and it might not fucking be there. <laughs> Where's the knowledge that I seek? Yeah, somebody else has got it. <laughs> when are they going to bring it back? They keep it for a month for a nickel. <laughs> How am I supposed to learn what I need to know? You ask your mother. <laughs> My mother doesn't know how to work a projector. <laughs> She's in dental school, for fuck's sake. Don't try to do the math on that bit. It'll just fuck you up. 
the guy actually stopped my show a few weeks ago, and he goes, well, now, wait a minute. Now, if, if this summer you were back in Las Vegas, and that's when you broke your tooth, and that's when your mother went to dental school, and now you're seven years old, you're saying your mother's already in dental I'm like, what? what, dude, really? You had no problem with Pearl jumping on my stomach and saying she could have all my babies at the same time. But the math on this one joke has got you so fucked up, you just have to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Tell you, the internet changed everything, man. It certainly changed the way people uh, don't buy uh, music, you know. That, uh, the, the, the record industry is on its ear, man, because what they manufacture became easier to uh, steal than it is to buy. And that's just a fact of nature these days, and they'll figure it out. But I used to sell millions of comedy albums, and now it's hard to sell them because it's just so easy to fucking rip it off. You know, just click, click, out of my IRA, into your I fucking pod. <laughs> when I was a kid, you had to get a ride to Sears, which is a building. You had to find the record department on your own. Then you had to cram a 12 inch by 12 inch album down your shorts. <laughs> then you had to SpongeBob SquarePants it with Led Zeppelin II crammed down your fucking pants, hoping nobody was gonna catch your ass. That's stealing music. We didn't have Viagra. You had to like somebody to fuck them. <laughs> I'm kidding. You didn't either. You didn't either. You didn't. Grudge fucked the hell out of them. We didn't have blue mountains on our beer cans to tell you if they were cold. You had to open the refrigerator and reach in there and touch that beer can or you'd never know. <laughs> but somebody somewhere went... Well, if we only had some sort of thermostat on each individual can, like a mountain's changing color to so see the optimum drinking temperature. Thank you, Rocky Mountain. Even though your beer tastes like ass. Those mountains should turn brown. <laughs> so I tour, that's what I do. I go from city to city to city to city. I've done it for uh, 27 years. I've been coming to Austin all 27 of those years, from the Velveeta Room to the Laugh Stop to the Capital City Comedy Club, to the Paramount, to the Paramount, to the Paramount, to the Paramount. <laughs> This is my favorite room in the whole wide fucking world, man. I tour with my wife usually, and I love to tour with my wife because I only have sex with my wife. I don't have sex with other women. I've been married three times, and that has not always been my policy. When I was young, I used to talk to my cousins about this race we were going to have to see who gets married first. I came in second, fourth, and seventh. I feel like my wife misled me a little bit when we first uh, got together, because when we first got together, she was all about, you know what, I don't ever want to have children. I'm just one of those women that never felt the urge to give birth. And I don't like real diamonds. <laughs> I don't like them because of that blood diamond thing. You know what I like to do? Suck dick and cook. I like to suck dick. <laughs> And I like to cook. In fact, when I'm not cooking, I'm sucking dick. And when I'm not sucking dick, I am cooking. In fact, if there was a way I could suck your dick while I was cooking, if we got a stool and you stood on it, and I could blow you while I'm scrambling some eggs, wearing fake jewelry, not having a baby, all at the same time. That would be heaven for me. Fuck me too. <laughs> Cut to five years later, she's on the phone with China trying to adopt a baby. She got a diamond on her finger. It looks like a solar fucking heating unit. 
I'm jacking off eating a TV dinner. Wonder what she's got under that Snuggie. I bet she's naked as shit under that Snuggie. We have a great sex life. You ever 69 someone so long you start to miss each other? <laughs> then the snow turned to rain. I love you. April, May. I need some food. And we can both use a shave. We did it one time so long it turned into another number. What is this, a 71? Have your toe in my nose. What the fuck? Kind of My wife has a new move in the bedroom. My wife's new move in the bedroom is, look at me. Look at me. Open your eyes, Ron. And look at me. And that's a lot of pressure. It is, to look into the eyes of the woman you love while you're making love, and look deep into her soul, and still see another woman what the fuck are you doing here? I thought you got hit by a bus. I'm great at sex. I come every time. I'm like 4,000 in a row or some ridiculous goddamn number. I'm gifted, really, I guess. My wife's maybe a third as good as me. I don't think she's trying. I asked her the other day, what's the fucking problem here, baby? She goes, well, for one thing, there's a fat, sweaty guy laying on top of me. <laughs> well, that'd break my concentration. <laughs> Get off me, dude, I'm trying to come. <laughs> That's not true, when I'm about to come, I have the focus of a Navy SEAL, I'm like, <laughs> Afterwards, I lay there like a wounded manatee. <laughs> Poke him with a stick, see if he moves. <laughs> My wife gives the best head if you ever have a chance. First time my wife gave me a blowjob, my hands went numb. I'm like, I'm either having a stroke or this girl knows her way around a whiner. <laughs> and I told her when she got finished, I said, that's the best damn blowjob I ever had in my life by a lot. And she goes, I know it's kind of weird because I used to be not that good at it. And I was talking to my friend, Tad, the florist who lives down the street, and I just asked him how he does it. You suck my dick like Ted the florist? <laughs> well, that motherfucker knows what he's doing, I'll tell you that, eh? <laughs> now every time I see Ted, I'm like, you ought to open a school, dude. <laughs> Call it Ted's head. <laughs> Tulips for every occasion. <laughs> you could open a head and breakfast. Well, then what would my slogan be? Food, it's the only thing that doesn't suck. <laughs> you guys have been fantastic. I'm gonna close with my, uh, oh. So nobody's watching the dogs, I guess. Uh, I'll try to get Pearl to play bite my face. Pearl's favorite thing, she can have all my babies at the same time. 
Her favorite thing in the world is for, to, for me to bite her face because she's like a billy goat fucking elbow or whatever. It has no feeling in it. So if I lay down on the floor sometimes, and she didn't do it last show, so you have to be quiet. Uh, she'll, if I tell her to bite my face, she'll run and jump up and land her mouth right on my face so I'll uh, bite it. So shh, 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 shh. Let's try it. Farrell. You want me to bite my face? Who wants to bite it? Who wants to bite it? <laughs> Well, that went way better than I thought it would. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna close the show this evening with uh, my Dr. Phil story. Uh, Dr. Phil McGraw is a is a friend of mine. We play golf together all the time out in uh, Los Angeles and. Uh, He's a great guy. You never know. We, we, we became friends from him being a fan. And, uh, and you never know if you see somebody on TV, what they're going to be like in person. Doc's a solid fucking dude. I guarantee you that. He's straight as he can be, but he's a great fucking hang. And he's a great asset for me. My father passed away when I was young, and now I'm in this big business world. And uh, I can bounce all these things that I have going on off of Doc and his 35 lawyers. And, <laughs> and that's a big deal for me. And... Uh, and I'm a really good friend with his uh, son, Jay McGraw. And, uh, but anyway, the other day I was talking to my son about self-esteem and a few days later I was playing golf with Doc and I said, Doc, if you were gonna tell somebody one thing to do to make themselves feel better about who they are, what would it be? And he said, finish the things you start. And I said, well, that's, that's brilliant. And I went home and there was a half a bottle of scotch sitting on the counter. <laughs> I think I know what he's getting at. <laughs> That's not my Dr. Phil story. Here's my Dr. Phil story. <laughs> Every year, Doc and his family rent a uh, yacht for 12 days in the Mediterranean, and that's their vacation. And it's the only way he can get away, you know, because he is the most famous person in America. He's the most recognizable face, six foot four, bald dome head, porn must, that you can spot him from any fucking way. <laughs> And because he seems so approachable on television, and he really is approachable, I mean, he's a sweetheart of a dude, but people are always, anytime he goes out in public, they're just, oh, what about, what about this? And that's fine at first, but eventually it will eat the skin off your fucking bones if you can't walk out of your house without somebody going, hey, my brother-in-law's all fucked up in the head, and I was wondering if you could just sit out for just a second, come back here, <laughs> asshole! And that's exactly how it happens. I've seen it, and uh, so that's what they do. Well, uh, last uh, this summer, my wife and I were, uh, went on vacation to France and Monaco, and uh, and I, I, you know, I need a break too. Sometimes I do 140 cities a year. I work, I do more dates than any other comic, uh, more cities than any other comic working the day because I just love fucking doing it. And and 20 minutes from now, nobody's going to give a fuck about what I have to say. So. Like, <laughs> While they do, I believe I'll do a lot of shows, hey. <laughs> so we're, we're in uh, France and Monaco and, and uh, having a great time, man. We're just, uh, I'm, I'm really in love with my wife. She's so, so, so talented. We have a fun life together and, and uh, we're, we're there. And then one day the phone rings and it's Doc and he goes, aren't you guys in Monaco? And I said, yeah. He goes, we're gonna be in Monaco tomorrow. Why don't you come party on the yacht? And I said, Fuck yeah. <laughs> Which is what you say if somebody says, you want to come party on the yacht? You go, fuck yeah. <laughs> In fact, let's try it one time. You want to come party on the yacht? Fuck yeah. I don't have a yacht. <laughs> anyway. So I was like, yeah, fuck, this is great, man. We're excited. We were down there. We were staying at the Fairmont Hotel overlooking the little yacht harbor in Monaco. Very cool place. And uh, we were down there looking at the yachts the day before, going, wouldn't it be cool if you knew somebody that had one of these things, you could just hop on it and fucking throw the fuck down. And, uh, 
And it's everybody's yacht, man. This is yacht heaven. This is Steve Wynn's yacht, Prince Albert of Monaco's yacht. This is that Russian dude with the tiny giraffes. Anyway, they're coming in at 6.30 the next evening, so the next morning we wake up, or next afternoon we wake up, and we go have this amazing lunch, and we're drinking this fucking great wine from France, probably. <laughs> That'd be my guess if I, if I had to guess, and I did have to guess. France. And uh, we're just having a great, great day, sex, and just a fucking, and then we go down to the fucking harbor that evening at 6.30, sure enough, Doc's backing in a 165 foot yacht. I'm not sure that's how they do it, but. So the only way to get on the yacht is to walk on this gangplank to get on the yacht. And I'm walking on the gangplank going, nobody's stopping me. <laughs> and we get on the yacht and there's our friends from California halfway around the world. Are you fucking kidding me? How much fun are we having? I'm hugging everybody. There's a bunch of people on the yacht. Where, okay, anytime I'm hugging you and I'm in, in, in a strange place, what I'm really doing is looking over your shoulder trying to find a bar. <laughs> That's why I'm turning you. <laughs> and I see the bar, and right in the dead front center of the bar is a bottle of uh, famous black grouse, uh, which is a, a, a scotch I started drinking uh, when I was in uh, Scotland uh, for the Open Championship at Turnberry. And uh, you start looking at what the Scots drink, and that's what they drink, and I'm like, oh, fuck yes. And there they had a bottle of it on the fucking, it's kind of hard to find. Uh, and uh, the bartender poured me a big old glass of whiskey, way bigger than this one. And I'm like, I'm in such a great mood. It tasted better than I'd ever tasted any fucking scotch ever. I'm like, oh, God, oh good Lord. What is that? That tastes like butter, honey, aged in Lindsay Lohan's pussy ear. <laughs> it tasted so good, I decided to skip dinner and just have a couple more of them. I'm going to scare me up another one of these. <laughs> How about one more? All right. I hadn't had a drink since lunch. I was fucking thirsty. <laughs> I was going at it, you know? And Doc noticed I was really drinking hard, and, and uh, he goes, boy, you're really drinking tonight, Ron. I said, yeah, Doc, sometimes it just tastes like spring water. He goes, why don't you just drink spring water, Ron? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not a fucking doctor. So this is going on for fucking hours. Now, now they really love Margo. They they're really, really love my wife, Margo. Margo sung on Dr. Phil's show a few times and they go everywhere to see her. And Margo's a four and a half octave classically trained opera singer that sings rock and roll and jazz and whatever. She's been singing here for years. And, uh, and Robin McGraw loves to goad my wife into singing and my wife loves to be goaded into singing. So they make a great little fucking team. And, <laughs> So we're on the back of this yacht, and, Mar and uh, Robin goes, come on, Margo, sing for us. And Margo gets up. There's people on the back partying on all these yachts, and there's bars on the pier, people out there. And Margo gets up, and she sings. And they love jazz in France and Monaco. They have jazz clubs all over the place. And she gets up, and she sings a jazz standard at full voice, which I, I, I don't get to hear her sing at full voice. She sings around the house, but not at full voice. And when she sings at full voice, it makes me cry. And I'm like, oh no. And uh, she finishes the first song at full voice and people stand up on the back of all these yachts and start cheering. They go, yeah. And I'm like, oh, how cool is this, man? They, they really dig jazz. I forgot how much they dig jazz. She gets up and sings another song, fucking screaming. And then people are gathering up around the back of the boat. And by song four, there's 400 people behind the boat listening to her sing. You could hear a 
pin drop, just like this, pin drop. And she's just killing it. And I have a little secret. I am fucking hammered, man. I am so drunk. I can't even believe it my fucking self how drunk I am. I'm like, Jesus Christ, whoa. And I would, I would take, I'd get a drink and I'd take one little sip out of it and I'd talk to somebody and I'd look back and it's empty. I'm like, anybody else drinking out of this glass? <laughs> Miscalculation. Anyway, she does, say, I don't know, seven or eight songs and she goes, okay, guys, that's enough. And she sits down and Doc goes, well, Ron, you want to do something? Now, I got to preface this with he's on vacation with his best friend and head lawyer and his wife, Mary Pat, and they're Baptists from Dallas, and they're a little fucking straight. <laughs> and they're about to find out my secret. <laughs> about 20 years ago, I was doing a bit that was so vile that I only did it for about a week, and I just quit doing it. I'm like, this is not the direction I want to take my crowds or my show. And, and I have no idea why I picked that night to dust her off and take her for a spin. <laughs> the other day I was tit fucking Mamie Eisenhower. Right before I came, my dick slipped and went straight down her tracheal tubes. Here's the moral question. Do you pull out or dump a load into her lungs? Yachts are pulling up anchor on both sides of us as fast as they can pull them up. They're leaving the harbor so fast, there's a surfable wake. There's a stampede of tiny giraffes diving off the pier, swimming towards the ocean in certain death. People are pulling their kids off the pier. I went, I don't think they heard me, I'm gonna do it again. Doc goes, that's enough out of you, Ron. And Margo's tapping me out. You ever been tapped out? She's, come on, baby, it's time to go. She's seen it. Come on, honey, let's just go back to the hotel. It's time for us to go. Come on, baby. Baby, let's just go back to the hotel. Come on, Ron. Let's, and I speak fluent drunk. That means I don't know why you want to have a... I wonder why you want to leave. I'm having a perfectly good time. <laughs> Turns out there was a consensus. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll leave. Now the only way to get off the ship is to walk back off that gangplank and at the, <laughs> at the end of the gangplank, there's an 18 inch drop off uh, and uh, my wife's in front of me, Margaret's in front of me and I get to the end of the, gang playing. Doc goes, big step, Ron. I said, thanks, Doc. Thinking I've made a big step towards something. Fuck, I don't know. He's a big psychologist, not me. It's amazing how much speed you could pick up in 18 inches. It's nothing like falling over on the same level that you're already on. I slammed down to that fucking pier. I landed square on this elbow, dislocated this shoulder, put a four inch gash down the back of my arm and I was so drunk, I just bounced off that pier. <laughs> Fade to black. I wake up the next morning with the shoe buddies. All I can do is lay there in bed and go, shoe buddy. <laughs> I can't move my shoulder. Shoe buddy. <laughs> My shirt stuck to my arm with blood and giraffe hair and whatever the fuck else you find on a pier. Shoot, buddy. 
I have a wet Jolly Rancher in my armpit. <laughs> Sour apple. <laughs> Had to cut it out with a pair of scissors. <laughs> you almost can't eat them after that. <laughs> Shoot, buddy. <laughs> I slowly opened my aching fucking eyes. And there's Margo. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you got really drunk last night, Ron. What did I do? Well, you did the tits fucking Mamie Eisenhower story. <laughs> did Mary Pat laugh? <laughs> Mary Pat left is what Mary Pat did. <laughs> Shoot, buddy. <laughs> You think they're gonna invite us back over to party on the yacht today? He goes, I don't know what's gonna happen now, Ron. I don't know. He walks out of the room, slams the door, and I just start berating myself. I'm like, you know, why do you do that, Ron? Why do you get so drunk it ruins things for other people? Why can't you just drink like a regular goddamn person? Is that too much to ask? You have a wonderful son and a beautiful wife, a great career. Why don't you make some changes in your life that'll make a difference in the long run? And about then the phone rang and it was Doc and he goes, you guys gonna come party on the yacht? And I said, fuck yeah! <laughs> Thanks for playing along. I've never performed for a better crowd in my goddamn life. Bless your hearts for listening so intently.